But you see, the, um, uh, statistically speaking, <laughs> a lot of common beliefs that are people holding on to. And for example, I'm too old to change my job, to leave my wife or my husband uh, or whatever. I'm too young. I don't have enough experience. Uh, it's not appropriate for someone in my situation because, you know, I'm a single mother and I cannot leave a job that I hate and it's making me come every day to my home in a terrible mood and, you know, then my kids are suffering because I'm angry and... but somehow it feels safer to stay. Now, is it really better? Now you tell me. You can always find another job. No one is saying go and quit your job immediately. You can, well, invest some energy in a way that we'll share with you probably in the last chapter of this course. But you can take some measures that will slowly enable you to transition from this situation that you do not prefer to the situation that you do prefer. Uh, but you just need first to use your courage to face your fears to find situ uh, definitions and beliefs that are coloring the situation in a way that you do not prefer, then own that belief, analyze it and change it. Okay. Then, I don't have enough money, uh, I've had rough childhood, I have the worst luck, uh, I need a partner to make me happy. Okay, that's also one belief that may hold you in a relationship that you do not prefer. I need a partner to make me happy. Without partner, I am completely unable to be happy. <laughs> it's impossible to be happy without a partner. Or there's something wrong with me. Now that's one of one great, that's great uh, belief because it can, you can apply it on everything. <laughs> or I can change who I am. Or I'm lazy. I'm just lazy. And that's not true. That's not true. Laziness actually doesn't exist. Lazy, you are lazy only about things that you do not prefer. So, for example, we already had that example, but it's worth re repeating. If you need to go now home and pack up your things and go to a business trip seven days somewhere and you, you are not too enthusiastic about that, that going home packing and that going to the airport and all that business trip and all those meetings <sighs> you would rather well skip that <laughs> you will feel lazy i don't feel like packing i don't feel like going to the airport and so on, and so on. but if you are tomorrow going to the airport to catch a plane that will well, bring you to the oh, to the vacation of your dreams, you are going to some kind of tropical paradise. Now, no laziness, right? <laughs> so, you are lazy only for things that you really do not prefer. If you, pre if you are doing, if you are focusing on things that you do prefer and that excite you, there is no laziness. So, I am lazy is just an excuse for not facing your own limiting beliefs. I am lazy means I am doing something that I really don't prefer and for some reason my ego is sending me a signal that doing that thing that I do not prefer is for me somehow more beneficial, more useful or better than the alternative of not doing that thing. And intellectually, that's not something that I would agree with. So, how about examining my own system of beliefs by asking what is the worst possible thing that might happen if I do the things that I do prefer instead of things that I don't prefer? Or what am I getting out of this situation uh, that I am stuck with things that I do not prefer? And it's probably uh, going to lead you to some combination of uh, shame because you are not good enough and fear because you'll die starving <clears throat> and freezing somewhere under the bridge or laziness because you don't have enough 
courage to face your own limitation, limitations. And then there's that thing of procrastination. You know, things that you should do, but I'll start tomorrow, I'll start next week, uh, that diet or that uh, exercise or something like that, or that book you, that you decided to write. Yeah, 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 <clears throat> I will, I will, but maybe not today, tomorrow. You see, there are books and books written about procrastination, and in a lot of them, the authors are usually giving you some kind of tips and tricks for time management. But procrastination is not a consequence of time mismanagement. It is a consequence of emotional mismanagement. You, when you think about that thing that you sh decided to do, to go on a diet, it just doesn't feel good. It feels better not to do that than to do that. Why is that? What, is, what are you afraid that is going to happen or what are you getting from this situation? And both questions will give you very interesting answers. So, what is the worst possible thing if I go on a diet? I will be hungry, I will be cranky, it's not going to work, uh, because, or I'm going to maybe lose some weight, but, but then after a while they're just going to come back, and it's more pleasant, you perceive it as more pleasant not to try it at all, than to try it and then to fail. But also there is the other side of the coin. What am I getting out of not getting, not going to that? Well, maybe you have friends that are also a bit overweight. And if you really go on a diet and you well, lose some weight, um, uh, as you <laughs> hope you will, maybe they will hate you, maybe they will envy you, maybe they are not going to like you anymore, they, are not, uh, they won't go to they're not going to like to go to you with the movies or they're not going to be friends with you and so on and so on and also you are getting a lot of sympathy for being maybe obese and you created all kinds of reasons that it is your right and so on and so on and you like to eat and blah 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 you know you don't need to go on a diet <laughs> but if you decide to go on a diet and then you notice that you are procrastinating, that you are just not doing that, ignore your thoughts that it's going to happen tomorrow, yes, yes, uh, after the summer or um, after the New Year's Eve or whatever, you notice, but you need to notice. And actually meditation is a huge help there. You notice that you are just procrastinating. You're just kicking the can down the road, so to speak. Why? What do I believe is true? What is the worst possible thing that might happen if I go to a diet? And what am I getting out of it? I ignore the excuses. Excuses are just a consequence of your vibratory state of anxiety, let's say, or shame, or guilt, because you are well, overweight, and so on and so on. And just face it. Face it. So procrastination is not about time management, it's about emotional management. And actually it's about management of your own definitions and beliefs. Also, some limiting beliefs will uh, mask themselves into something that is, well, positive. So, for example, uh, I'm, I, I, I still uh, didn't start writing my own book because I need to do it right. It, it needs to be perfect. Now, you see, perfectionism it feels like something that's great because you are concerned about doing a great job, but actually it's a form of shame. Because what you are really afraid of, what's the worst possible thing that might happen if I write a book and then publish it, that everyone will see that it is not good enough and I need to write a little bit more about it or I'll start when I have a perfect idea uh, I, I still need to work on a concept 
and that's a perfectionism, that's a form of shame, and that's just not helping, actually it's stopping you in your tracks. Exactly as Salvador Dali said, have no fear of perfection, you'll never reach it. <laughs> Then, of course, people say after this course, after they see the value of this technique, yes, it was great, I really enjoyed your course, but I didn't start using the insights that you gave us because I don't have enough time, or I'm tired, or I'm overworked, and you know, I'm constantly anxious and I am waiting for a perfect moment to start manifesting my reality. Okay, but what exactly is anxiety? Now, that's something that all of us do carry inside of us, even when things are going great. There is some undercurrent of what if this happens, what if that happens, and so on. Actually, it comes from trying to use your ego uh, in um, getting some advice from it, how to be safe in some unforeseeable distant future, and that's pretty much impossible. And what your ego is going to say on that is you should be smarter, you should be better, you should be wiser, you should be richer, and so on. Because you are not smart enough, you are not pretty enough, you are not likable enough, and so on and so on. And that creates anxiety. But what is actually anxiety? Anxiety is energy of excitement filtered through a belief in something undesirable or unpreferred. So, anxiety is excitement with a negative judgment. If you remove the negative judgment, all you have is excitement. And then you won't be tired anymore. It's all about your resistance to the situation. So, you have anxiety of a future. How are you going to well, conquer that anxiety? With confidence. Exactly like we conquered fear with courage. Anxiety that comes from uncertainty, that's fear-based belief, that is coming from fear-based belief that something terrible is going to happen in the future can be counteract with the confidence. Now, what is confidence? We are talking about definitions now. Confidence is not about having the answers for all the unpleasant things that might happen in the future in advance. Confidence is about knowing that whatever comes in your way in your future, you can handle it. You can deal with that. And the living proof is you sitting here right now. Now, all of you conquered a lot of well, challenges and problems and uh, unexpected situations and sicknesses and whatever it is. Each and every one of them you conquered up until this moment, right? So, why not believing? It is about belief. Why not believing that it is just going to well, happen? So, confidence is not about conjuring all the possible situations, what might go wrong, and then thinking about all the different solutions that you probably could or will be using, because you simply cannot plan everything that will go wrong, that might go wrong. And you know that. And since you cannot plan all the things that might go wrong, well, there will always be anxiety, fear, because what if something happens that I didn't plan for? But if you know for sure that whatever comes your way, you will be able to handle it one way or the other, no anxiety. And then there is no resistance inside you, and then energy will flow freely through you, and you won't be tired anymore. And actually, you will raise your frequency, and that will give you access to the thoughts and ideas and creativity. 
that will allow you to handle your affairs or things that you need to do in a much more efficient way. And then you will, well, create additional time for yourself. Because what took you eight hours yesterday to do, now you will do it in six hours and you have additional two hours for yourself. And you don't need to worry because you are confident that whatever comes your way tomorrow, you will be able to deal with that. But you need to conquer your own limiting beliefs and definitions and you cannot conquer them until you are able to put yourself in a witnessing position and see that things that are going on in your life are sometimes creating emotions and thoughts and actions that are not exactly in alignment with what you say you prefer and then you need courage to see exactly what's going on and to find that limiting beliefs, accept them, own them, analyze them and when you find them and analyze them you will see that actually, well, they are just smoke and mirrors but they are going to give you some resistance, they are going to create additional fear. As, 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 clo as closer and closer you get to your limited beliefs, they will create more and more fear, because that is actually the only, um, the only tool they have in their arsenal to stop you from even going there. Because they know that if you go there, you will just let them go, and they don't want them. <laughs> they are designed to perpetuate themselves. They don't have a mind of their own, but they are designed to perpetuate themselves by using your own motivation mechanism against you. Then there are general beliefs. Beliefs that are... Well, of course, when you accept them, then they become personal, but they are, let's say, taken from the environment or from the society. For example, life is hard. Life isn't fair. It's not that easy. No pain, no gain. Now, if you believe no pain, no gain, then the idea of, for example, switching to another job or uh, leaving the relationship that really is not in your best interest will, you know, create a sensation of heaviness because changing a job is difficult, because everything is difficult, <laughs> because Without pain, no gain. If I want to have a better job, I need to invest a lot of energy. But that's just not true. That's just not true. Certainly, some kind of effort is always going to be required. But if you focus on something that you do prefer, there will be no problem with motivation. And there will be no more pain in doing so, because you know, the labor of love is no labor at all. Now, that's a belief I would really like you to install in here and remind yourself from time to time that when you are doing something that you do enjoy, it doesn't feel like work. It feels like jobby. <laughs> Your hobby, that's job because someone is paying you for that. And when you are get, getting money for doing something that you enjoy, and your job is your hobby, it's your jobby. <laughs> so, no pain, no gain, that's just not true. Or maybe the economy is bad. The economy is bad is a belief that if you're holding on to, it, when it can really stop you from leaving the job you don't prefer because the economy is bad and, you know, it's difficult to find another job. Economy is bad for whom exactly? There are a lot of people who profited from the recessions and crises and so on and so on. So that's just a belief. It's not a fact. Sometimes it's maybe true, sometimes it's not. But as a general rule that is uh, well, controlling your life, I would really suggest you to drop it. Or maybe it takes money to make money and I don't have enough money. That's also not true. I mean, there are a lot of people that started from zero and now they have a lot of money. Actually, there's a term for that. In America, they call it an American dream. Starting from nothing and making a lot of money. So, 
It takes money to make money, maybe, but you don't need to have that money in advance. Maybe you can borrow it from a bank. Maybe you can find a financier. Maybe you can finally get money from venture capital. I don't know. There are plenty of situations. Maybe you can partner with someone who already has money and so on and so on. So use your imagination. But if you hold on to limiting belief that in order to make money, you need to have money and you don't have money and you're holding that here, it will create unease when you think about doing something that you do prefer, some job that will make you money, and it will give you emotion of, uh, I don't know, shame because you're not good enough, or guilt, or fear, or even anger. Because I don't have money and only people who have money can, that's not fair, life is not fair, and so on and so on. And you're, you're just going to think about how that's not fair and you are not going to act on it. Actually, you are going to act in a way that you do not prefer. You will hold on to a job that you hate. Because it's bringing you some money. And uh, since there is no hope of you having enough money to make more money, well, that will seem less painful or more pleasant than the alternative. And the alternative, of course, being well, doing that thing nevertheless. Well, well finding a way to find money, finding a partner, just involving yourself into that project of creating something that you actually enjoy and you see some sense in that. Some, there is some meaning for you inside that new idea that you would like to manifest but you are not doing that because you believe that it takes money to make money or that life isn't fair or whatever it is. Or people are not trustworthy and therefore if you have hold on to that belief that may also stop you from uh, looking for a partner who will give you some money or invest some money in order for you to do a job that you do enjoy and you do prefer and so on and so on. But also there are contradictory beliefs. Now these are really sneaky. <laughs> so for example, you can hold on to belief that I will be happy only when I earn enough money. And to another belief that says the love of money is the root of all evil or money corrupts, or power corrupts. So what is happening there is you are unhappy because you don't have enough money. Your belief that you need to be, have enough money in order to be happy and fact that by your own account you don't have enough money is going to create unpleasant emotions. You're, you're probably going to be angry about that, for example. But then again, when offered a possibility to earn some money or to invest yourself in a project that's going to bring you a lot of money, you may feel hesitant if you believe that money corrupts. You see? And that creates all kind of, well, schiz that's kind of schizophrenia. You don't know where to go. I want money, but I don't want money. But I want money, but I don't want money. But I I'm not going to be happy until I have money, but I don't want to take any money because that will make me well, a terrible person. And these kinds of situations are common. What is going to happen in the end? You are going to act in accordance with a belief that you believe most strongly. Or so maybe you will ignore that, um, that money corrupts and say, you know what, I'm going to do it anyway. If that corrupts me, so be it. Or you are going to go the other way and, you, and being a good person, not being corrupted in this case, is uh, better than uh, having a lot of money and then you will remain unhappy <laughs> until you release that belief that only money will make you happy because there are plenty, billions of people in the world that are pretty happy having very, very little money. It's not about, it's about how much you need, not how much you want. So that's fear. Fear is number one enemy 
and anxiety and irritation and anger and jealousy and envy and these are all fear-based well, vibratory states. But there is another enemy that's even more sneaky and that's denial. And denial happens because of the motivational mechanism, because it seems less painful not to face that issue. You know? So, for example, as we said earlier, uh, someone asks you for a dance and then you say, oh, no, no, I don't, I don't actually dance. Well, why not? It's going to be fun. No, 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 no I, I'm not. If you believe that you are a bad dancer and that everyone will laugh at you and you are going to be ashamed and everyone will talk about you and laugh behind your back how terrible you are, you will go into denial mode. And what's interesting about people who are in denial, they are also in denial about being in denial. <laughs> So, if you don't want to dancing because uh, you believe that you're a bad dancer and someone tells you, oh, come on, doesn't matter that you don't know how to dance with, it's not about that, it's not about that, it's not, <laughs> and so on and so on. You see, it is all just a reflection of one simple problem that we addressed in the beginning of this section, and it is wrong identification. If you identify yourself with your ego, you are going to be get you are going to get in all kind of troubles because this is just your defense mechanism designed to keep you safe, to help you survive, not to make you happy or to help you find your life purpose. It is just designed for your survival and it will make, it will create a vibratory state out of your sensory inputs that will create certain situations feel like unpleasant in order you to not address them and that's exactly what you should do. Because please remember, as the great poet Rumi once said, when someone beats a rug, the blows are not against the rug, but against the dust in it. Now, that may feel like a subtle difference, but actually it's not. All those beliefs that you are holding and that you, are, you, are, you can correct using the tools that we are sharing with you, it's not about you. Don't take it personally. Don't identify yourself with your ego. Otherwise, you will feel worthless and examining your system of definitions and beliefs will be something that you would rather avoid. Because it would feel unpleasant to examine them because of the fear that you might find in there something that's saying that you are really bad person and you are worthless and you are stupid and you are not likable enough and you are not smart enough and uh, no one likes you and so on and so on. That has nothing to do with you. That's coming from this. Well, this is an, an algorithm. This is a program and it can be programmed by you if you observe the big picture. If you are able to pull out of that situation and observe a big picture by using well, meditation as a tool. But please let me here address one well, common misconception that is getting popular these days. And it is about mindfulness. So I hear a lot about mindfulness. Now, even in corporate, you know, uh, conventions are now talking about being present in the moment, being mindful, not allowing your emotions to get better of you. And that's partly true, but please make sure that you are using meditation in order to be able to see the big picture and not to avoid your own limitations. 
Please remember the fourth noble truth. We had that in the third chapter. And it is about a Buddha's solution or cure to well, human suffering. Meditation and the way of life that is consistent with it, that doesn't create unnecessary suffering to yourself or others. Now, this is really important. So, meditation, yes, but also a way of life that is consistent, that is not creating unnecessary suffering for yourself. If you use mindfulness, just in order to see that you are miserable every morning and then you say, okay, I will stay in the morning, I will stay in the moment, I'm sorry, <laughs> I will stay in the moment and uh, then I feel no misery and then I will be able to go to my work without feeling too much heaviness. That's just, you know, putting some sand on a piece of shit. I mean, I'm sorry for the well, term, but that's exactly what it is. Maybe it will smell a little bit less, but you solved nothing. So, you use meditation to observe all of that and by knowing that it is your fear and your denial that your ego actually is going to use in order to stop you in changing something in your life. Because look, ego is about your own survival and you here today, is you, you are alive, right? <laughs> so, you survived. So, whatever it is that you are doing, just keep doing from the perspective of ego. Because it works. Don't change anything. So, you are miserable at, job, at your job. So, what? <laughs> you are definitely alive. So, your job is in some way helping you survive. And please don't change that. That's what ego is going to say. But you know what? If you don't have a purpose, if you don't find any meaning, if what you, whatever it is you're doing is pointless to you, you are just committing a very slow suicide. From spiritual level, maybe not, not from physical level, but your soul is dying. If you are not following your excitement, if you don't well, act in a way that has a meaning and purpose for you. And using meditation or mindfulness, it is a well, modern way of saying, just in order to avoid facing your own soul, or at least your preference, well, that's called spiritual bypassing. And it is a terrible thing to do. I really don't recommend it. <laughs> Using spiritual techniques in order to be unspiritual, to act in completely unspiritual fashion. So, when someone asks you, do you like your job? If your answer is, oh, well, it's fine. That's not good enough. I mean, great, don't quit tomorrow and then worry about how you're going to pay your bills. But just make note that you should step by step do certain actions in a well, way or in a direction of your preference. If you, but that's not going to happen if you define your job as, define your job definition as, oh well, that's something that everyone needs to endure in order to pay their bills, to survive. Okay, or I'm not good enough, or uh, economy is bad. These are all just excuses. And this is a little bit unpopular to say, but I'll say it anyway, and I hope you're going to be able to deal with that. The reason why we hold on to our negative beliefs, it is not only because <laughs> our ego fools us. Actually, ego doesn't fool you, it's just an algorithm. It's a program that you get to program if you want. If not, it will be programmed by society and your boss and your wife and everyone else. But, you know, 
this is not just something that will fool you into believing that there is no... It, it is something that will put you in, a, a, let's say, a victim mode. And it will create all kind of drama. And we enjoy drama. It is unpopular to say, people don't like hearing that, please, if you feel denial, <laughs> if you feel that's not true. That's the first clue that there is. Because if, you, if I say something that's completely uh, meaning, meaningless, it won't create any kind of emotion in you. If I say, you know, sky is red or green, you will say, no, it's not. And not, no emotion comes out of it. But if I say, you enjoy drama, and you say, no, I do not. A denial, <laughs> a denial, <laughs> as Kurt Cobain would say. And if you uh, feel some kind of fear on that idea, that's also great, because that means that you should do something here. But, you know, we all enjoy drama. We enjoy it that much that it is not enough to just be a part of your life drama. We invented theater many, many, many years ago, thousands of years ago. We invented theater because we don't get enough drama in our life. And then later on, that wasn't enough too, because it's not exactly efficient. Only a few hundred people can see one drama, maybe once a day in some theater. So we started recording the dramas. And uh, we call that movies. And now we have a lot of drama <laughs> that you can witness other people's drama, mostly invented, but never mind, <laughs> made up, uh, that you can enjoy on your television or in your movies. But even that wasn't enough for our appetite for drama. We started recording very, very long movies and then chopping them up in pieces and that we call television series. Even that wasn't enough. And then we created soap operas, you know, dramas that go on for years and years. One hour of television content every day. And now we have reality TV. <laughs> so our appetite for drama is unsatiable, unsatiable. And this is also one of the tricks your ego is going to use against you. It is going to use denial, fear, and also your well, af affection for things getting out of control. <laughs> and, you know, one of the greatest uh, doctors or physicians, actually father of uh, modern medicine, uh, he said, before you heal someone, ask him if he is willing to give up the things that made him sick. Are you really willing to give up all that drama, being a victim, uh, be, because the world is cruel and, uh, and the economy is bad and uh, everything is terrible and there are conspiracy theories and uh, the food is poisoned and there are too many people on the planet and so on and so all those beliefs. Are you really willing to give them up? And you should, if you want to be able to create your own reality. You can do that. It's not that difficult. You need to meditate at least a few minutes a day to be able to observe this process. And to notice that when something happens or something that you imagine, is creating different kind of emotion that you would prefer. I mean, on the face of things, uh, imagining something that you would really enjoy doing, maybe, I don't know, painting, painting or um, whatever it is, designing web pages. So you think about how exciting that would be, but there's a certain unpleasant emotion because you're not good enough. Uh, uh, there's, there, there's, there is no market for that, or there are too many competitors or so on. You should stop. And then face your own limiting beliefs. Find out what they are. And then when you put some light on them, 
You, you will see that it's just smoke and mirrors and they will disappear. Everything springs out of your own definitions and beliefs. Everything, your reality as you perceive it, is 100% reflection of your reality blueprint. 100%. This creates your thoughts and emotions and even gives you uh, well, access to certain memories. And then you do uh, some actions and then you force your... So, somehow we uh, believe or we are led to believe or we feel like we are, uh, well, one insignificant point uh, in a world that's huge, that has, I don't know, seven, eight billion people, and nobody cares about you. And it's all just on a small, tiny rock that's revolving around one, uh, one of the, well, least significant stars in this huge galaxy. And this galaxy is one of the billions of galaxies in the universe, and it fa makes you feel complete. That idea makes you feel completely insignificant, like a wind blown, blowing the leaf, and you are that poor little leaf that has no control over its life. But actually, it's completely the opposite. It's like this. You are projecting your own definitions and beliefs outwards. And that's how you manage your perception. By transforming negative energy or beliefs to a more positive one. And using circumstances that you do not prefer to your advantage. So, something happens that you do not prefer. That, that makes you angry. You can, A, <laughs> number one option, remain in that state of anger. You will have angry thoughts and you will do angry actions. You will try to um, make some kind of revenge or get even or whatever. And that will create your reality because the other party is also then going to uh, think about how to get revenge on you and so on. And so on. Or you can say, that's really interesting. What is it inside myself, inside my own systems of the system of definitions and beliefs, that is creating the experience and vibration of anger in this particular situation? Someone told you that you're stupid and that insulted you and now you are angry. Why? Why do you care? Or, if you want to use Buddha language, who is exactly insulted? Your true self is not insulted. <laughs> your being is not. Your ego is insulted because, probably, there may be different reasons, but probably you suspect that uh, what he said about you, that you are stupid, is somehow true. And now you are angry because that person brought that idea or concept to light, and now he, in some weird way, allowed everyone else to see that you are stupid, and now the society will going to reject you, or blah, 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 whatever it is that you are afraid. What is the worst possible thing that might happen? Okay. But make note, we enjoy that there is a part of us, and that's here actually, that's uh, small and petty and revengeful and vindictive and envious and jealous. And that's part of being human. And we enjoy that drama that's going on in our life. Please let us not pretend <laughs> that we don't. Everyone enjoys some kind of drama. Actually, a lot of people, when are suddenly in a situation that there is not enough drama in their life, they create something. 
Because if nothing is going on, then life is boring. And that's a belief. That's just a belief. I must have drama in order for my life to be exciting. You see? So you somehow connected through definition or through belief a link between exciting life and life full of drama. Is that really true? So that's how you use circumstances that you do not prefer in a positive way. Because you use them to find out what exactly is the definition or the belief that is behind it. O.S. Krishnamurti told us, be a light unto oneself. Or as Jung would put it, face your own soul. It's exactly like peeling an onion. So this uh, ego structure or system has a lot of layers. And each of these layers create, uh, is created by some belief or definition, and most of them are fine. Not all beliefs and definitions are bad. So there is a belief, for example, that if you jump off the cliff, that you will die. And that's great! That's excellent belief! That will help you survive, really. If you walk through the woods and suddenly you come close to a cliff, you not you will suddenly be afraid. Your ego will pick up from your eyes that you are approaching the cliff. That will get filtered through your definitions and beliefs. Uh, then there is a rule inside that definition that says jumping or falling from the cliff is really bad for your survival. That will create fear and that's great. Your action will be to stop or to move away from that cliff, and that's what exactly ego is designed to do in real time, right now. Right now, when some uh, dangerous situation is perceived, immediately emotion will come, thought will come, I need to move away, or just something, and you will do an action and you will survive. That's brilliant. You see, but there are a lot of uh, beliefs and uh, definitions that are out of alignment. You need to peel them off. And when you remove any one of them, it changes your vibration. It changes your frequency. And uh, somehow uh, your frequency will rise. Why? Because all those negative beliefs are ballast. You don't need them. You, they are holding you down. And when you remove ballast, you won't be tired no more. Because that resistance, that ballast, is what's making you constantly action, anxious and overworked and tired and so on and so on. So all those feelings like disappointment, anger, embarrassment, irritation, resentment, um, frustration, jealousy, fear are very clear moments that teach you where it is that we are holding back. Find that. Face it. Face it. First you need to recognize it. And that's probably not going to happen if you, medit if you don't meditate. Then uh, you need to admit it. That's definitely not going to happen if you don't meditate. Then accept it, own it, analyze it, and change it if you find out that's not something that you resonate with. Of course, from time to time you will find uh, that what's uh, creating your fear when you are close to cliff is a belief that falling off the cliff is a bad for you, and you will decide to keep that belief <laughs> because it's uh, well very helpful. But from time to time, you will, or uh, by using, better yet, by using situations that are creating emotional state and, of course, faults and actions that you do not prefer, in a way that they are using them to point to you things inside your own system of definition and belief that is out of alignment with your preference that you don't prefer. If you do that, you will feel lighter and lighter and you will 
raise your frequency and you will have access to thoughts that are coming from the higher consciousness levels and well you will be more successful with much less effort your life will begin to have a purpose and a meaning and you will be calmer and happier but i'm talking about true happiness about full about feeling fulfilled it's not about uh, it's not just about uh, you know rush that you get when you jump uh, or when you drive a roller coaster I mean, riding a roller coaster is great and it creates certain kind of rush unless you are holding to the definition and belief that says that's dangerous for you, but okay. But uh, it just uh, lasts for a minute or so and that you're back. But this is happiness and content and fulfillment and certain calm and peace, but that is also in the same way, in the, at the same time, exciting, and I really would recommend that. <laughs> and it doesn't uh, has anything to do with outer circumstances. With less effort, you will be more successful because you will have ideas and creativity from the higher consciousness levels. But it all starts with you being well willing and ready to see what exactly is inside this rule-based system that is uh, painting your perception in a way that well you do not prefer and then making appropriate changes the more clearly you understand yourself and your emotions the more you become a lover of what is. When you understand your emotions, how are they created and what is creating them, what kind of rules, you will be a lover of what is. Now, what is, it talks about a present moment. And if you look carefully, it's always now. It's always now, when you become a lover of what is, of if you become a lover of right now, you will be happy and fulfilled and content, no matter the circumstances.